tragic incident occurred at Dundee on the evening of Monday 2nd January 1865. It took place at the Bell Street Hall, a large concert room situated immediately below the United Presbyterian Church on Bell Street and Constitution Road. The hall was well known in Dundee as it was well used for concerts and other entertainments given from time to time by Mr Springthorpe. The hall was poorly constructed with regards to public safety, the main access being in the opinion of theatre goers very dangerous. Entrance to the hall was gained by a flight of stairs leading down from Bell Street into the large area beneath the church. The top of the stairs was guarded by an iron gate and as this opened inward it was easy to see the danger that could arise from an enthusiastic crowd putting pressure on it as it was quite narrow. On that fateful Monday evening a large crowd of people had assembled at the gate hoping to gain admission to a promenade concert which under the title of Springthorpe's Exhibition had been announced as one of the attractions of New Year. Queues had formed around five o'clock as they waited for entry. At the allotted time, the man in charge opened one half of the gate to allow people to make their way into the hall and take their seats. When this was being done, the pressure of the crowd waiting was so strong that the man working it was overpowered and the other half of the gate was burst open. Those at the front of the crowd were swept through the narrow opening and forced down the stairs. Confusion and alarm at what was happening ensued and efforts were made to stem the pressure from behind but to no avail. The people next to the gate were pushed down the stairs en masse as those behind were pushed into them and toppled over them. Before the pressure could be alleviated, a confused heap of people several feet deep were piled in a small space of about six feet at the bottom of the stairs. Nearly three quarters of an hour elapsed before these people were rescued from their position. Many had been crushed to death, but exact figures were only released later and a large number of people were injured. The scene was described as horrific. Suffocation in most cases was the cause of death, with some having broken limbs. Some of the survivors, however, were injured during the rescue operation. One or two who were pulled out alive soon died in the arms of their rescuers. The ticket collector narrowly escaped with his life. The tragedy sent shockwaves through Dundee as news of the incident spread, but most concern was for the young people thought to be in the crowd. Reporters at the time wrote of the many touching scenes that took place during the identification of the bodies, all of them later identified by family members and friends. All of the dead belong to the humbler classes, as the press put it, with three quarters of the deaths being boys and girls aged between 12 and 18. For around 15 or 20 minutes, no one really took in what was happening until finally it dawned on people the magnitude and nature of the disaster. And it was only then that the crowd at the top of the stair began to move back and leave space for those who were able to give assistance to the injured below. This wasn't easy, as the bodies of those lying on the floor were entangled. As one contemporary newspaper described it, arms and legs of different persons being interlaced and huddled in one compact mass. 
In their eagerness to give assistance, those who began to pull the dead, dying and injured, which included police officers who had been controlling the crowd outside the hall, were in danger themselves of inflicting serious injury on those who lived by dislocating their arms or legs. Body after body was pulled out of the heap and carried into the hall, which by this time had been cleared and they were laid anywhere that was suitable. Those injured were also carried into the hall and placed in an area of safety. The first body, which Dr Smith's attention was directed to, was that of a young man lying near the door, but it was clear he was dead. Near to him were about a dozen others, also all dead. And during his examination of them, Dr Smith realised they had all suffocated in the crush. Close to the entrance of the lobby were the bodies of two young girls, aged about 14 or 16, lying in each other's arms. Soon, notice was taken of a body of a stout man lying on the floor, his mouth wide open. It seemed he had died while trying to free himself from the mass of people who lay on top of him. On a raised bench at the east end of the hall was the body of a boy of around 13 years old, who looked as if he had simply fallen asleep, as he had no marks on him. In a small room upstairs, occupied by the hall keeper, Mr Cooper, on the floor in front of the fire were laid four bodies of young boys and girls. Near the door was a young girl who had almost suffocated. People were working on her, rubbing her temples and arms to help her circulation. Miraculously, the young girl survived thanks to their efforts and she was taken home during the evening. A large number of those who were rescued first were sent to Dundee Royal Infirmary, while others who were fit enough were placed in cabs and sent home. Around this time, Dr Gibson, Dr Langlands and Dr Cooper arrived, doing what they could to help. Four boys who'd been rescued were attended to, with hopes raised that they would survive. However, they died a short time later. A boy and a girl who were taken to the anteroom also succumbed to their injuries. Most of the front of the crowd who had been pushed to the bottom of the steps had died before they were freed. Not many had bruises, and only a few had broken bones. One 13-year-old boy, John Holland, was lying unconscious at the top of the stair. He was put into a cab and taken to the infirmary, but died on the way. Three children were found dead, jammed against the railing, three or four steps from the top of the stair. By 7.30 that night, it was all over. And in total, 20 people were dead, 11 males and 9 females, with the youngest victim being 9-year-old Mary Robertson and the oldest, 63-year-old James Knight. The first body identified was that of Patrick Swinney. His mother was devastated. But the nightmare wasn't over for her, as in another corner of the hall lay her husband, Joseph, who had also lost his life. She was left a widow with four children to support. The next to be identified was 17-year-old Mary Ann Findlay. She was identified by her mother, who held her daughter in her arms, sobbing uncontrollably. The grief of those who identified the other bodies was just like hers, as one by one the victims of the Bell Street Hall disaster were identified. The day after the disaster, the Procurator Fiscal, John Boyd Baxter, 
carried out his investigations into the incident, but decided no one was to blame. It was simply an accident. But some people weren't happy with his findings, and the following Sunday, the minister of the Free Church, the Reverend Taylor, blamed it on people's love of pleasure. The hall reopened soon after the disaster, but in February that year, the Reverend Mr Borwick and the church authorities informed Springthorpe that once his contract ended in April, it wouldn't be renewed. <laughs>